John Eliot and the Indians, 1652-1657, to being letters addressed to Rev. Jonathan Hanmer of Barnstaple, England. Prologue. The letters of John Eliot were printed here belong to the period when he was most actively engaged in his work among the Massachusetts Indians. They were addressed to the Rev. Jonathan Hanmer, minister of the church at Barnstaple in Devonshire, whose interest in Mr. Eliot's labors had been enlisted by mutual friends. July 27, 1649 of the Corporation for the Propagation of the Gospel among the Indians in New England. The efforts of the new corporation were at once directed to the raising of funds for the purchase of tools and other necessities required in the building of the new town. It was at this stage of affairs that Mr. Hamner wrote to Mr. Elliot on March 12, 1652, announcing that an unnamed gentleman, parenthesis, Mr. Capital S P E A C O T unparenthesized had made a liberal gift of fifty pounds, which would be laid out in such commodities as were most desired. Mr. Elliot replied in two letters, dated July nineteenth and October seventh, sixteen fifty two, as follows The Letters Roxbury, july nineteenth, sixteen fifty two. Reverend and dear sir, I have received your letters dated March 12, 1651. Footnote. As the legal year began at that time on March 25th, it would be reckoned as 1651 up to March 24th, but would be called 1652 according to our present reckoning. Wherein the Lord hath made you an unexpected instrument and a messenger of encouragement and supply upon his this work of the Lord among these poor Indians, and in that it may be when expected helps may be more slow, that so the Lord might please to show himself the only guide and provider for his people in all their ways. I desire to acknowledge the Lord herein, who hath never failed me in this work of his. It is meet that I should inform you of the state of this work, that your prayers may be, with the more particular faith and fever, be breathed forth at the throne of grace in the behalf of this work and those which labor therein. I cannot be so particular as I would, by reason of straits of time, the ship being quickly to sail after I have received your letters. If the Lord give you opportunity of going to Exeter, E-X-C-E-S-T-E-R, or of intercourse with with Rev. Mr. Nichols, by him you may hear somewhat more than I can now write unto yourself. The Rev. Ministers and Christian people there having been these two years contributors towards this work, and by whose supply a great part of the work for the civil part in charges and expenses have been carried on. After several years preaching to them, the Lord opened their heart to desire baptism, to seal up pardoned of their sin, and to desire church, estate, and ministry, whereby to enjoy all God's ordinances, and to enjoy cohabitation and civil government, as subservient unto, and greatly conducting unto the spiritual ways and mercies. In this order they have been taught, they must have visible civility before they can rightly enjoy visible sanctity in ecclesiastical communion. Hence we look out a place fit for to begin a town where a competent number of people might have subsistence together. In the year 1650 we began that work through rich grace. In the year 1651, in a day of fasting and prayer, they entered into a covenant with God and each other to be ruled by the Lord in all their affairs civilly, making the word of God their own Magna Carta for government, laws, and all conversation. And choose rulers of tens, fifties, and of a hundred, the platform of which holy government of God's own institution. I have sent over this year unto 
Mr. Nichols, with the Reverend Elders in Exxon. And if the Lord give you opportunity, I should gladly wish yourself might also have a sight of it, that I might receive your animaversions on it. But in my poor thoughts, I apprehend it would be a mercy to England if they should in this term terms of lines take up what form of government which is a divine institution and by which Christ should reign over them by the word of his mouth but I forget myself I am speaking of the Indians whom I desire to train up to be the Lord's people only ruled by his word in all things and the Lord hath blessed them in this their government and guided them in judgment this present year the Lord seemeth to ripen and prepare them for holy church covenant, whereby they give up themselves to be governed by the Lord's ecclesiastically and all his ordinances and church administrations. But I shall walk by good advice before I do this. They are now building themselves a meeting house, which, when it is made, it may please the Lord to call them forth to be built a spiritual house unto the Lord. Touching what you say of my writings for a supply of books for my brethren, M.A.H.U., it is true I did so. But soon after the Lord was pleased to offer a comfortable supply both to him and me also. For I bought two libraries of two ministers who left us, and they are both paid for by the corporation in London. And my brother Matthew hath been possessed of his a good while. Besides the reverend elders, ministers of Exxon, have sent unto us new supply, and this year they sent unto us the second edition of the new annotations upon the whole Bible, so that through the riches of God's bounty he is now supplied, but what particular books he may further want, I cannot tell you. Sir, you make mention of a liberal gift of a religious gentleman whose name I hope I shall hereafter know, that I may express my thankfulness in a few lines unto him. And whereas you require to know in what commodity it may be most suitable laid out, I answer in two commodities chiefly. First, in strong loin cloth, canvas and other good hemp pin cloth, and lock rooms, because in the hot summers the Indians delight to go in linen and work, if in any garment, only a linen garment, if they can get it. Secondly, in red, blue, or white cottons, coarse and thick, some call it trading cloth, which is the coarsest and some better. Only these two sorts of commodities are best for the present. The way of sending may be by ships from Barnes Staple who have often recourse hither, and by some Bristol ships, who also trade hither. If by London, then there is a faithful friend of mine, Mr. Capital B -U -L -C -H -E -R, who will convey any such things to me. But it may be the goods had better be taken up in your country than to be bought in London. Sir, I do also request this, that if any ships come from Barnstaple, you would please to appoint some or other discreet and godly man, able to judge wisely and discern, to set apart so much time as to see with his eyes and hear with his own ears how the matters are here carried, and what is done among the Indians, and should he have a good allowance for his pains, it would tend much to the furtherance of our work and comfort of our hearts. And may you please to communicate this, my motion to Reverend Mr. Nichols, and consider what were wisdom to be done in this case. Nay, if some of the churches should send forth a minister and other faithful brethren on purpose to visit and comfort and encourage such a work, I see not, but it were a worthy work, and well becoming the spirit of the gospel. But I can now go no further. I do humbly bless the Lord for the prayers that are made in all the churches in the behalf 
of this work and us that labor in it. I beg for the continuance thereof, and so commending you and all our holy labors unto the Lord, and to the blessing of his grace I rest. Your unworthy fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, John Eliot, Roxbury, this 19th of the 5th, 1652, addressed to his reverend and much respected brother, Mr. Hammer, Minister of the Gospel at Barnes Staple in Devonshire. These, I pray leave these letters with Mr. John Clark, merchant at Mr. Dunn's house in Blackwell Hall, to be sent safely as it is above written. <laughs>